It's time to begin our Bible study. You already have a Bible study tonight? Okay, we're in the book of um, Hebrews chapter 4. So um, we'll go ahead and pray tonight, and, um, and then let's see how it goes from there. It's a short chapter, so I'm hoping we can get it through, or get all the way through tonight. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you tonight for this Bible study. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be able to come and to teach your word. I pray, God, that you will accomplish your will here tonight and, and draw us closer to you. Open our understanding to your word. Help us, God, that we may be able to take your word and apply it to our lives and that we may live for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hebrews chapter 4. And so we're, um, we're talking about God or the, the apostle writing to these disciples, trying to encourage them to continue in the faith. And to um, let them know that they made the right choice in choosing Jesus. So you'll hear me say this over and over throughout the Bible because that's really the, the theme I'm try, trying to drive home. <laughs> that we made the right choice in choosing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so last time we stopped off with um, chapter 3 verse 19. I'm going to read verse 19 again because that will roll us right into what we're talking about tonight. He said, so we see then that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And we talked about last week that there are three major sin that can really affect us as human beings. And there are many other sins. All sins, you know, all, all other sin is still wrong before God. But there are three sins that, that can really affect us. And we mentioned last week that the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost... Jesus said is a sin that will never be forgiven and you can find that in Matthew chapter 12 verses 31 and 32 where Jesus was um, he was doing great things he was doing miracles and and all these wonderful works of healing and casting out demons and and recovering of sight and all these work he was doing by the power of the Holy Ghost and the people the Jews they they attribute all those works to the devil Instead of giving credit to where credit is due, they look at all the works of Christ and they said, oh, he's doing that by Beelzebub and by the prince of the devil. And so Jesus told them this. He said, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall, it shall not be forgiven him, or it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Showing us the pro, that the greatest sin really is to, to speak against the Holy Ghost. And we want to be careful about that because today there's a lot of people who will not even recognize the deity of the Holy Spirit. They degraded Him to just a force or just uh, something that God used, but He's not. He is a person. He is the part of the Trinity. He's God. And we do not want to cross that line in dishonoring the Holy Spirit. And then the second sin is pride. And as we shared, this was the first sin that ever recorded in the Bible. It was a sin that turned Lucifer into the devil. It is a deadly sin because pride refuses to listen to any reason. And then the last one we talk about is this sin of unbelief. I share that because I want to show you the severity of unbelief. And he tells us in chapter, in chapter 3 verse 19, he said, So we see then that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is what kept them out of their promised land. And unbelief will keep a lot of people out of the promised land of heaven also. And so I use that as an introduction to lead us into chapter 4. And I'll read a few verses, at least the first five verses we'll deal with first. Chapter 4, verse 1. He said, Let us therefore fear, least a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 
For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, verse 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh, seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. And so he's speaking of a rest, that there is a rest. There is something waiting the people of God. There is something that God has prepared for his people, and he referred to it as rest, to where there will be no more labor, there will be no more work, there will be no more praying, no more soul winning, no more necessarily all the things that we have to do or we do as a Christian, you know, fighting against sin and fighting against the devil. We won't have to do all of that. There's coming a day when God will allow us to enter into his rest. But he said, just like Israel, the thing that kept them out of their rest, their promised land, and he's speaking about the generation that Moses brought up out of the, out of the land of Egypt. He said the thing that kept them out was unbelief. The thing that kept them out or kept them from entering was unbelief. They did not believe God. And because they didn't believe God, they were kicked out or they were kept out of the promised land. And so he's calling us or he's cautioning us and all us right now. But when this was written, it was written to the Jewish believers. And so he was cautioning them. In verse 1, he said he was cautioning them to pay close attention to their actions and lifestyle leads them miss out on eternal life altogether. You see, our lifestyle and our actions and our behaviors is very important. We have to live a righteous life that is built upon faith in Jesus Christ and His Word in order to enter into the eternal rest God has for us. And so read in verse 1 again, He said, Let us therefore fear, be afraid, or be, be conscientious about not be conscientious about living right so you do not miss out on this rest that God has promised to his people. He said, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. It is possible tonight if people, as Christians especially, if we are not careful. To live a holy and godly life, it is possible that we can miss out on eternity. Amen? Yeah. And what a dreadful thing that is. What a dreadful thing that is. And I'm not sharing this so that we should necessarily be afraid, afraid, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm scared I'm going to miss out. If you live right, if you're doing right, if you're obeying the Bible, if you're listening to God and following God, there is nothing to be afraid of. But if we are not, if we are not living the way God wants us to live, then we ought to be afraid. Amen? We ought to be afraid just like Israel. They did not want to listen to God, and they were kept out of their promised land. In verse 2, he shows us the importance of believing the Word of God when it is preached in truth and by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so he was sharing with them, he said, just like us today, we come to church, and the God give the preacher a message, and he preached that message to you, telling you things that God laid upon his heart, and God uh, uh, moved him to preach about. He said, just like it's being done today, it was done to them. But it didn't do anything for them. It didn't cause them to change. It didn't cause them to, to believe God. It didn't cause them to change their ways and, and humble themselves before the Lord. He said the reason why is because it wasn't mixed with faith. In other words, they didn't believe the messengers of God. Moses stood up and preached to them. They didn't believe Moses. Joshua stood up and preached to them. They didn't believe Joshua. And all these others that, that preach and speak in the name of, of the Lord, they took it for granted and they didn't believe it. And so it had no impact on their lives. 
And that's a very dangerous thing. People come to church week after week, month after month, year after year, and they still struggle with certain things, and God gave them the answer through the preaching, but the preaching didn't do them any good because they didn't believe what the preacher was saying. Amen? Amen. The preacher tell them they have to get saved, but they will not humble themselves and come to the altar and repent. The preacher tell them you need the Holy Ghost in order to live, the Holy Ghost baptism, in order to live a powerful and successful Christian life, but they wouldn't believe the preacher. They feel that they can do it in their own strength and their own ability, but then time and time again, they fall short. The preacher tell them that they have to live right, they have to be faithful to God, but they won't believe the preacher. Oh, it's just the preacher. No. He said here in verse 2, he said, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. He said, But the word that was preached to them, or the word preached, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so he's shown us the importance of faith. Remember what I'm talking about, the sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief. The word that was preached to them didn't do, do any good to them because it didn't have the right mix. You know, if something is not mixed properly, it's not going to work. Amen? You try to pour some, some, some concrete and you don't mix it right, it's not going to work. You try to take a shower and don't use any soap, it's not going to work. <laughs> Amen? You can go in there and turn that shower all you want and hot water and, and scorch yourself. <laughs> But it's not going to get you clean if it doesn't have the right mix of water and soap. Amen? You try to bake a cake and leave the eggs out or whatever is required to put in that thing. <laughs> whatever it is to, to, to get it, it's not going to work. Or bake a bread and leave out the yeast. You know, you get unleavened bread and then you have to keep the Passover. <laughs> but it won't work if it doesn't have the right mix. And so it is also with church, with Bible study, with Bible reading. None of these things will work for us if we don't believe it. Amen? And so he's shown us the importance of believing God, or he's shown us the severity of unbelief. It stops everything. Amen? It stops everything. And so he said that the word preach didn't do them any good. It didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so it's important for us tonight to realize that when the message is being preached, realize that God, if God placed a message in the preacher's heart, and you know the life of the preacher, and he's praying, and he's coming, and he's bringing a message, it may be something simple, but if God is talking to you through him, and, and you know God is, the Word of God is speaking and touching your heart, you know, we ought to believe it, amen? Mm -hmm. We ought to believe it and put it in practice, because if we don't, it's not going to do anything for us. And then in verse 3, he said, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And he's quoting this from, from the Psalms. I'll read a little bit of it in Psalms 95 verses 8 through 11. We'll just read these three verses and then We'll go back to our Bible setting. And the reason why is because most of it that I will share with you is quoted from Psalms 95, verses 8 through 11. He said, Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with, that, with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And that is recorded in the Psalms, Psalms 95, verses 8 through 11. And so most of these verses, or these few verses I will share with you, has to be, has, are quoted from that passage of Scripture. In verse Verse 4, he said, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his work. In verse 5, he said, And in this place, going back to Psalms 95, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Now, verse 4 is a quote, also, as you know, from Genesis chapter 2. God created the world. God created, recreated everything. And then on the seventh day, he rested. So there's, he's talking about that physical rest. God rested. But here in our Bible reading, 
He's talking about a spiritual rest or an eternal rest. And so the first one he deal with there in verse 3 said, For we which have believed do enter into rest. Speaking of a spiritual rest. Now when a person gets saved, when a person gets saved, they enter into rest in God, spiritually speaking. In other words, they're not overburdened by sin any longer. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, if, he said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest. Amen? So the first rest there he's mentioning there is that rest of being, of, the, of taking the burden of sin off our shoulder. When we get saved and we give our life to Jesus, he brought us into a spiritual rest. And then he mentioned the physical rest from which God rested. He said, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from his work. So that's a physical rest. Rest. And then verse 5, he's talking about the rest that Israel was supposed to have, when it was supposed to go into the promised land. He said, and this, in verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Now verse 6, he's going to talk about a different rest, which is the one we're focusing tonight, and that is the eternal rest in heaven. Amen? That's the one we were focusing tonight. So you said, Preacher, you're talking about all this rest. I'm, I'm getting sleepy. I'm drifting. <laughs> I'm falling asleep. I'm resting. Well, rest is for those that work. Amen? <laughs> those that labor, they will... Those that get up and work and labor, there is a time when they will, when they will receive rest. There's a time, man, I've, I've worked all day long. It's time for me to get some rest. It's something that you go into. You work into it. And so that's what he's using here to explain to us that we as Christians, and as, of course these believers in, 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 the, in this time, he's letting them know there is something greater. There's a greater rest. There's a far better rest than entering into the promised land. There's a far better rest than going and get a nap. There's a far better rest than taking a vacation. There is something greater that God has prepared for His people. And that is an eternal rest in heaven. Amen? That is an eternal rest in heaven with Almighty God living in the kingdom of God. And He said this rest in verse 6, He said, Seeing therefore it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached enter, in, enter not in because of unbelief and in verse 7 he said again he limited a certain day in David that's what I read to you earlier from Psalms 95 today after so long a time as it is said today if you will hear his voice harden not your heart so Israel didn't listen to God Israel didn't listen to God and because of that they were kept out of their rest their promised land and so he said, because of that, God turned from them and God reached out to the Gentile world. Right? He reached out to us. And so he's given us a chance to enter into a rest, but not like the one that he was trying to lead Israel into. Right? They were going into a physical promised land in Israel. We are going into something greater. Amen? We're going into something greater. And just like they had to labor, had to work and go in and fight the enemies and get rid of all the, the obstacles that were in their way and all the enemies that are in their way, they were supposed to defeat all the enemies and then go over and take the promised land and enter into their rest. So also we as Christians will have to fight off all our enemies. Amen? We'll have to fight off doubt. We're going to have to fight off fear. We'll have to fight off unbelief. We'll have to fight off the devil and all these things. We have to labor, in other words, to enter into this rest that God has prepared for us. Amen? And so he's letting us know that uh, there is a rest. Heaven is this rest that God wants for us. And we have to do something to make it into. We just, it's not just going to happen. Amen? We can't just sit in unbelief and say, you know what, God, I don't believe you, and I'm just going to wait to the end and see what happens. It's not going to work that way. Amen? Or we're not going to, we can't be like Israel and, and be discouraged and just sit still and say, well, there are giants in the land. I can't do it. And still expect to enter into that rest. They didn't get in because they were too lazy. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want to go and do what God wanted them to do. 
And so they couldn't enter in because of their unbelief and their unwillingness to follow what God, follow God and do what God wanted them to do. And so it is also for us, if we make it into heaven, if we enter into the kingdom of God, we will have to do what God tells us to do. Amen. Amen. And we'll have to believe the Lord because if we don't, we're not going to make it in. Amen. We will not make it in if we do not believe the Lord. And so we'll get back. We'll, we'll, we'll show you how all this tie in in just a little bit. Just bear with me as I'm working down the scripture. Because remember, we're talking about the sin of unbelief. That's what kept them out. They did not want to believe God. And so even when the word was preached to them, they didn't believe it. I mean, they heard it, but they still didn't believe it. And so we're working towards that tonight. In verse 8, though, he said, For if Jesus, and that, that, that the word, G, or the name Jesus there, is the same name as Joshua or, or Yehoshua, Y E H O S H U A. The Joshua, Jesus, they mean the same. It means deliverer and it's pronounced the same. So in verse 8 there of Hebrews chapter 8, he said, For if Jesus, speaking of Joshua, had given them rest, then would he not have afterward spoken of another day? Verse 9, he said, There remained therefore a rest for the people of God. So he's showing them what he really was talking about. He said, Moses didn't bring them into the promised land, so they didn't get, they didn't get to go into the promised land. Joshua did. But even, even after Joshua brought them into, Israel, into the promised land, Israel, he said, yet God was still speaking of another rest. Showing us that's not what God was concerned about. Yes, he wanted to bring them into the promised land, and that will be their land of rest where they can build their family and, 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 and cultivate the land and establish their community and, and set up their, 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 um, all their, you know, their, their shops and everything and, and build something there in that land for themselves. And that would have been good, and they would have rest. God would have given them rest from the surrounding nation from wars and stuff like that. But that's not what the Lord was focusing on. Amen? That's not what God was focusing on. God was always focusing on something eternal. Something far better. And, and so he's letting these Jewish believers know, God has something better for you. You made the right choice in choosing Jesus because he is the only one that can really take you into this true rest. Amen? And so he's letting them know, yes, you had Joshua and Joshua brought you into the promised land and everything. He said, but that's not really what it's all about. He said in verse 9, They remained therefore a rest for the people of God. They remained therefore a rest for the people of God. And the only way that we can get into that place of rest, which is heaven, is through Jesus Christ. Right? It's through salvation. It's through accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior and living for Him. So He's letting these disciples know. Remember, you're going to hear me say this over and over. You made the right choice. Amen? You made the right choice in choosing Jesus because He is the only one that can take you into the rest of God. Joshua couldn't do it for you. He took you, yes, into the physical one, but that's not what's important. You can't keep that forever. You only have so many years to enjoy that land and then you're gone. So he's letting them know you made the right choice in choosing Jesus because the real rest for your soul, the real rest that God wants you to enjoy, it's in a place called heaven. And the only one that can take you there is Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so he's encouraging them, you made the right choice. And so we can say this to us as Christians, we made the right choice. Amen. We made the right choice because there is a rest, there is a place of eternal rest. And the only ticket to that place is Jesus Christ. Amen? So we made the right choice in choosing Jesus. Now, in verse 10, he said, For he that is entered into his rest, he also had ceased from his own works as God did from his. Going back to Genesis, when God, after God created everything, the Bible said on the seventh day, he rests. The work was over, right? He rested. Jesus, after he accomplished his work on earth, he came, he did what the Father wanted him to do. He preached to us the kingdom of God. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again from the dead and was on the earth for, a space, for about a space of 50 days. And after that, what happened? He was ascended up. Acts chapter 1, right? I think it was. The Bible said they watched him as he ascended back into heaven. And he went and sat down on the right hand of the Father. 
he finished his work, he entered into his rest. Amen? God the Father rested. Jesus rested. And now he's saying to us that we have to do something too. Verse 11, God rested. God ceased from his work. Jesus rested after his work was over. Verse 11, it's time for us. Right? He said, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Amen? Getting down to the nitty-gritty of things now, he said, we have to do something. Amen? We, as Christians, have to do something. We can't sit and be lazy and expect to enter into the rest of God. Amen? Amen. God didn't rest until the work was done. Amen? Six days of creation, then he rested. As he mentioned here in verse 4, he said, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest. He didn't rest until the work was over. Amen? Jesus didn't rest until his work was over. And so he's saying we also are not going to enter into the rest until our work is over. Amen? Amen? Until our work is over. So we have to labor. We have to pray. We have to dig deep into the Word of God. We have to be about the Father's business and soul winning, trying to reach people for God. And a good way right now we're doing it online, share it. Amen? That's a way of labor and share it, right? It's just share it, send it out to people and let them hear the Word of God, invite people to church and, and all these things, whatever we do, it's part of labor. And as I preach Sunday night, we're working for something better. Amen? And that better is eternal rest with God. And so he said in verse 11, Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall short after the same example of unbelief. We cannot allow ourselves to drift into unbelief and laziness. Amen? Because once we do, we will jeopardize our, our opportunity from entering into the rest that God has for us. Amen? Now, going back to faith and unbelief. See how we got to mix all these things together to make it make sense? <laughs> verse 12, which is a very popular verse of Scripture. He said, for the word of God is quick, which means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so he's showing us how powerful the word of God is. That this word is like a sword. It can pierce. It can get deep. Amen. And as I've shared before, there is nothing in this world that can separate the soul from the spirit. Amen. The only thing that is designed to do that is the word of God. Amen. The only thing that is, de that is designed to go between the soul and the spirit are so inter interwoven or intertwined that nothing can get there. Nothing can do that. Nothing that man can come up with because man don't even know what a spirit is. Amen. He doesn't understand it. There's nothing that can get deep into the soul and the spirit. The only thing that is designed to do that is the word of God. As he said here, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Nothing can do that but the Word of God. And so He's showing us how powerful the Word of God is. It's a very powerful thing. But, going back to verse 2, He said, For unto us was the Word preached, as well as unto them. But the Word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard, that heard it. So He's showing us that even though God has given us the most powerful thing, in the universe, which is His Word. It will do us no good if we don't believe it. Amen? It will do us no good if we do not believe the Word of God. We have to believe. And that's the reason why there's so many people still struggling with sin and struggling with things that are wrong in their life is because they do not believe the Word of God. Because if you believe it, or if we believe it, like we say we, we do, we will obey it. Amen? We will do it. We will submit ourselves to it because uh, our belief will cause us to act upon the things that, 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 we, that, that, that we say we believe. Our, 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 our belief will cause us to act upon it because we're testifying, I believe that this is true. 
And so we find that even though he said the word of God is quick, it's alive and powerful, it's not going to do us any good if we don't believe it. We have to believe it. Amen? We have to believe it. And so that's why Israel could not enter into the promised land. It was because of that sin of unbelief. And so tonight, if we will enter into our promised land, which is heaven, we have to believe God. Amen? We have to believe, and as Paul said, he said, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. He said, but we are of them who believe to the saving of the soul. You see, a lot of people may say they believe God, but they don't believe God enough for the saving of their soul. They don't believe God enough to be obedient to God and to submit themselves to God and to follow God the way that God wants them to, to follow Him. Amen? And so we can't fall into the same trap that Israel fell into, that, that trap of unbelief. We have to believe God. And then we'll wrap it up in the next three verses there, verses 14 through 16. And we're just going to barely touch on this because that will lead us into chapter 5 about the priesthood of Christ and showing them that they have a better high priest than ever they did in the Old Testament. So verse 14, he said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus is the best high priest ever. And so he's telling them, you have the best high priest. Yes, you gave up the high priest in Israel, or the earthly high priest to follow Christ, he said, but don't worry about it because God gave you the best. Amen. Amen. God gave you the best. He gave you Jesus. He's right there mm -hmm. on the right hand of God. You don't have to ever worry, worry about him dying <laughs> like all the other high priests. You don't have to worry about him have to offer a sacrifice for sin. He have no sins. He's perfect. Amen? Amen. And so he's saying you got the best high priest in Christ. Don't go back to the old way. God gave you the best high priest that can make intercession for you. Verse 15, he said, Jesus can relate to you. He can be touched or he can feel your pain. He can understand your struggle because he went through the same thing that when he, he went through the same thing that you go through when he was on the earth. In verse 15, for we have not an high priest or our high priest is not like one that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. In verse 16, he said, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help, to help in time of need. And so, like I said, I'm not going to spend very long because I might talk about this again next time. But he's saying in the last three verses, God gave you the best high priest. Talk to these Jewish believers and us. God gave us the best high priest, Jesus Christ. He can relate to you. He understands what you're going through. He can feel your pain. He went through the same thing. And in verse 16, it's so wonderful. He said, let us therefore come. But don't come to a temple in Israel. Don't come to some earthly high priest, a man. You don't even know if he will go and pray for you. Amen. He said, come to the very throne of God. That's the most beautiful thing about it all is that we can go straight because of Jesus Christ. We can go straight to heaven with our prayer request. Amen? Amen? We can take our concern, our case, whatever it is, we can take it straight to God and we can go there 24-7. Amen? It's open. We don't have to worry about our high priest sleeping when we need him. Amen? We don't have to worry about our high priest being sick when we need him. Amen? Amen. Our high priest is there on the right hand of God. He ever lived to make intercession. And so he gave us an invitation. He said, let us therefore come boldly. So tonight, wrapping the Bible study of don't fall into the same trap of unbelief like Israel did because God have a greater rest for us, something far better. Amen? Amen? And so we have to do something together. We have to labor to enter into that rest. And as we do, let us realize that God has given us the best to do it. Amen? All the help we need is available to us. All we have to do is get on our knees and send the Lord an email and He will answer it. <laughs> yeah, a knee text, <laughs> an email, okay, knee pads of righteousness. <laughs> Just get on your knees and send God that, 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 that prayer request. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace, and He will help you. Amen? Amen. And we'll close the Bible study in that tonight. And since we don't have that, we'll ask Nathan to, to close us. We can hear you now. <laughs> Love you.
Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Bible study and that we've made the right choice. You assure us every time we open your word, every time we kneel in prayer, every time we hear your voice from heaven, God, bless us tonight. Bless this Bible study that we have. Bless our journey back home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.